Eye contact is not only an important part of verbal communication in humans, but it serves as being extremely important when it comes to non-verbal communication as well. And it may be that reason that, for centuries, the eyes have been a source of intrigue and mystery for many people, with many legends and wild ideas popping up around them, just like the Sampaku eyes we discussed previously. But one idea that is maybe even wilder than that is optography. Wilhelm Kuna is probably a name you are not familiar with, but he created a word that you have no doubt heard, that of enzyme. But it's his other research that lands him on this iceberg. Wilhelm was a German physiologist whose career spanned from 1856 to 1900, where his work mainly focused on the physiology of muscle, nerves, and vision. With the latter, he had become particularly interested and inspired by another physiologist, Franz Boll, who had discovered something called Rhodopsin in 1876. Now Rhodopsin, known better as visual purple, is a light-sensitive protein that is found in the retina of your eyes, which helps you see in low light conditions. It absorbs what light is available and triggers a signal to your brain, letting you perceive images even in the dimness. This photosensitive pigment in your eyes, Wilhelm believed, under ideal circumstances, could be fixed like a photographic negative. So he soon began testing, not on humans at first, obviously. Instead, on animals. He eventually refined the process where he came up with the chemicals needed to fix the image on the retina, which he called optograms. His most successful one, he would get from a rabbit whose head had been fastened to look at a barred window. The bunny's head was then covered for several minutes to allow visual purple to accumulate on the retina, and was then uncovered for three minutes to expose it to light. And then, uh, he was decapitated by Wilhelm, and the eyeball was taken out and sliced top to bottom. The rear half of the eye was put into a chemical solution, which resulted in a distinct image of barred windows, as you can see here. This excited Wilhelm, and now he wanted to find a human subject, although I'm not sure how many volunteers were excited to be decapitated, but it would not matter because in 1880, a Erhard Gustav Reif was set to be executed on November 16th for the murder of his own children. After the guillotine struck, the eyes were taken out and sent to Wilhelm at the University of Heidelberg, where he went about dissecting them in a darkened room. After 10 minutes, Wilhelm came out with his less than exciting discovery. On the left retina, he found an image that did not appear to match anything at the time of Erhard's death, although some would claim that it matched the outline of the guillotine's blade. And it's also possible the experiment floundered because Erhard had been blindfolded at the time of the beheading. But that wasn't the only issue. The actual focal point of the image of the retina is tiny, which made it difficult for Wilhelm to extract an image versus the many rabbits and frogs that he had so much success with. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, Erhard would be the only human test subject for optography. And the original image from that experiment has been lost to time, and we're left only with the crude drawing created by Wilhelm. But we're really just getting to the interesting part of optography. Think back. This is the Victorian era. Hyde of Jack the Ripper, Scotland Yard, Sherlock Holmes. Well, it was during all that, police investigators began to wonder if they could use optography to help solve murder cases. I mean, wouldn't it be great if you could see what the last thing was the victim scene? Then nailing the murderer would be easy. But this wasn't exactly a new idea, because in 1877, the Berlin police had photographed the eyes of a murder victim on the chance at some point they could use it to solve the crime. But we fast forward a bit to London police detective Walter Dew, famous for being involved in the hunt for Jack the Ripper, who would admit years later on to having used an optography on victim Mary Jane Kelly in a desperate hope to finally catch the Ripper. Other Ripperologists since then have speculated that optography was also used on Annie Chapman. And if you're thinking that this is one of those cases where science just wasn't advanced enough to outright discredit Wilhelm, then think again. Because American physician and someone who had assisted Wilhelm in his lab, W.C. Ayers straight up dismissed optography, claiming that the images produced were not distinct enough to be useful. 
and that even in the best circumstances, the retina of a person who had met sudden death would produce basically useless images. And the science and theory began to slowly fade away into history, especially once Wilhelm passed away in 1900. But it would be 24 years later that optography was successfully used as evidence in a murder trial, the first and only time. After German merchant Fritz Angerstein killed eight members of his family and household staff, a professor at the University of Cologne would photograph the retinas of two victims and claimed he was able to produce the images of Angerstein's face holding an axe. And in at least one of the murders, Fritz did indeed use an axe. Now this would be used as evidence and Fritz was convicted and executed. However, it should be noted that, according to at least one newspaper covering the trial, when Fritz was told of the incriminating optograms, he just confessed to all the murders. So it's not like they were actually used as evidence or anything. But we fast forward to 1975 when research was reopened on the idea of optography and the University of Heidelberg would look into Wilhelm's findings and did experiments with modern techniques and equipment. They found that, like Wilhelm, they could also produce a number of distinct images from the eyes of rabbits. But they were able to once and all conclusively rule out any actual use of it as a forensic tool. And although it was ruled out as a crime fighting tool, optography did find a home in pop culture as it has appeared in different forms of media. For example, a short story written by H.P. Lovecraft, the Doctor Who television series, and the Wild Wild West film. In fact, it was so popular in fiction in the early 20th century that murderers would sometimes destroy the victim's eyes to prevent them capturing the image on their retinas. This happened as late as 1955. The name George Ellery Hale may not mean anything to you unless you have a big interest in science and outer space, but George, an American astrophysicist who lived from 1868 to 1938, is best known for not only the discovery of magnetic fields and sunspots, but also known more for his planning and construction of several of the world's most important telescopes, as well as playing a key role in developing the California Institute of Technology as one of the leading space research universities in the country. So, he was an incredibly smart guy. So much so, that even Einstein was impressed. But just how did George come up with all these ideas? Was Einstein helping him? Did he just have a good team of researchers? Or was he just ahead of his time? Or maybe, he received regular visits from an elf that advised him. Yeah, apparently, George would have this elf show up pretty often who would advise him on the best placements to put telescope observatories, as well as sharing technological information and building plans with him. Or at least, according to one of his biographers, Helen Wright, she would record that George was a workaholic because of a condition he was thought to have called hypomania, which causes a person to have revved up energy or activity level. This often left him suffering from burnout, and finally, he could take it no more in 1911 and he decided to go to Europe for a little rest. It was while in southern France, he started going through a severe bout of depression that he later called a breakdown, when this little man suddenly appeared out of nowhere, advising him on several things. The appearance of the man caused a ringing in George's ears. After this first visit, he would appear often in various places. George would even refer to him as a mascot. But years after Helen published this, Skeptics and defenders of George would come out and claim that the stories of the elf entity all came from a misunderstanding, and they proceeded to sweep the whole thing away. But what was this misunderstanding? Well, that goes back to Helen's source. See, she was given complete access to several boxes of material about George's life and career by none other than George's widow, who encouraged Helen to write his biography as well as being very supportive of her. But it's in this box of documents Helen came across a letter that George had written to an author and friend, Richard Goodwin. It was this letter that Helen used as the source for the story of the elf making the visits. However, that's not exactly what the letter said. Upon closer inspection, George never said an elf visited him. Instead, he wrote, a little demon visited him. In fact, the exact quote is, Until I got back from Egypt, I was able to read with pleasure a great variety of books, but now I can't keep my mind on the subject. 
as the little demon stands by my side and every few minutes prods me with the suggestion that, after all, the book is not interesting and that all my attention belongs to him. How to escape this new form of torture, I do not know. So the skeptics of this claim stated that the little demon was meant to be taken figuratively, not literally. But what really makes this one stand out is, George did have real psychological problems, along with neurological ones. He dealt with ongoing insomnia, as well as headaches and depression. There's also the allegations he had schizophrenia, which is also heavily disputed. Regardless of how much is true, George would occasionally take time off and check himself into a mental hospital where he would stay for months at a time. His mental health got so bad at one point that he eventually had to resign from his role of director at an observatory, and he would actually pass away at the sanitarium. So he obviously had some real mental health issues, which brings me back to Helen Wright's claims. Yeah, maybe she took that letter the wrong way, but that's not all that she cited. She also claimed that remarks made by one of George's physicians, a Dr. Leland Honeycutt, backed up the elf story, which brings us to theories, which George Hale, one of the best scientific minds of the 20th century, tormented by some elf-like being, or maybe a demonic elf, or was he suffering a psychotic breakdown and hallucinated this individual, or as the skeptics claim, it was all the case of a mistaken biographer. This next strange obscure mystery comes from a now defunct website that actually copy pasted a story from the also defunct paranormal section of about.com, a site we have visited many times thus far. The writer of this article is Stephen Wagner, a paranormal researcher and writer who is still active to this day, but came to prominence with his writing on about.com. This story is told by Stephen on that page, and it's told in the first person point of view but since Wagner is a researcher and usually wrote articles about paranormal phenomena that people sent into him, I'm going to assume that is what happened here. Because we have no name that is cited by Wagner, nor the other website the story was featured on. With that out of the way, the story starts with the anonymous person driving through a desert part of a northern state, which one this person does not name. But all of a sudden this person, that I'm going to assume is a male, would be struck with an insanely crazy sight. He's seen these lizard-like beings, two to three feet high, standing near the sides of the gravel road the author was on. He would cite they looked intelligent, and not exactly like lizards, nor did they even look animal. Instead, they were just really ugly. They continued to follow him with their heads and eyes, before he began to panic and sped up to get out of there. Then, as he increased with speed, the road he was driving on, turned to a light brown packed earth drive, and all of a sudden, the trees around him were different. And not just a little. These were trees he had never seen before. They were colored oddly and had curly leaves and vines that smelled funny, which he could smell through the road down window. If that wasn't enough, he now seen these small squat human-like individuals on the sides of the trail working, and they were not paying attention to him. Instead, they were picking up these big triangular fruits and hitting them with sticks, but they began to look at him and shook their heads as if he had made some kind of mistake. It scared this person so much that he wet his pants. He then stomped the accelerator and got out of there, driving until he finally reached a place where everything was normal again. And that's pretty much it. A very small story that leaves us with more questions than anything else. Like exactly what kind of experience was this? As it is entitled on the iceberg, Stephen Wagner's time slip to reptilian future, the theory is that this person, whoever he or she was, somehow ended up in a far future or alternate reality where reptilians now rule the earth. But how would this happen? As we have mentioned before in this series, it is theorized by many scientists that we are living in one of numerous dimensions where each one could be very similar or incredibly different. How to get to these other dimensions is a matter of debate. But one idea often theorized, especially in fiction, is that of a portal opening up spontaneously and a person inadvertently going through it and either traveling to an alternate dimension or traveling to the far future, which also kind of fits the next theory of a reality glitch, an event where all the basic rules of reality are thrown out the window 
and anything goes. But what about some more grounded theories? Well, of course, one is he entered an altered state of consciousness, possibly from taking a drug, or it's even possible this individual fell asleep for just a few seconds and dreamed the whole thing, only to awake and realize he was still on the road driving. He may have even been suffering from highway hypnosis, which can occur when someone has been behind the wheel for a good distance. Finally, perhaps this was nothing more than a fictional account sent to Stephen. Two thousand three, Wellington, New Zealand, RNZ or Radio New Zealand senior music producer David McCall would suffer a setback that I imagine is very frustrating. As he made his way to his car, he would walk up to see someone had broken out the window. He immediately peeked inside to see his briefcase had been stolen. He of course notified police, who would begin an investigation, and just three days later, he got a phone call from them telling him, we've got your briefcase, you can come and get it. After getting there, he was told that someone had brought the briefcase in after finding it, setting at the harbor, where exactly was unknown. But the briefcase did have seawater in it, and the documents were all soggy. But at least he got his briefcase back, right? Well, yeah, but it was missing one key thing, David's security card, which allowed him access to the Wellington Town Hall and the Michael Fowler Center, a local concert hall. Although I'm sure David had no problem in getting a new security card, he would be a little bit perplexed when he received his old one in the mail 21 years later. And where it came from was even more bizarre. But first, we have to go back to 2016, 13 years after David lost his card. A man named Rod Budd, a diver for the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, or NEWA for short, was working with some other researchers on the seafloor at Cape Evans. He would see what he thought was a credit card at the bottom, but it was too dark to tell, so he picked it up and put it in his pocket to look at when he surfaced, because in this area of the ocean, there's not a lot of debris, and he had only came across a handful of items in his career. Once he surfaced, he cleaned the card to see David's name, as well as seeing that it was a Radio New Zealand security card. He thought, well, I should probably send this back to him, but once he returned, he'd end up being one of those things like, eh, I'll do it tomorrow because Rod would sit on the card for eight more years until he finally got around to mailing it in 2024, although other sources claim that it just took Rob that long to track David down. Regardless, it's one thing for David's card to have been stolen along with his briefcase, and it's another thing that it was even found on a random dive in the ocean. But what is really super crazy is the location. Yeah, this happened about 12 miles off the coast where New Zealand's Scott Base is located in Antarctica, hence the reason why those divers rarely see any items on the seafloor. So how in the world did this card end up almost 2,500 miles away, under six and a half feet of ice at the bottom of the ocean? That is the mystery. And you may assume, well, it rode the ocean currents, but NIWA principal scientist Craig Stevens noted that the chances of that were, in his words, infinitesimally small. He would even map out the potential journey it would have to make, starting with sinking below the underwater canyons of Wellington's Harbor, entering the western boundary current, past Samoa, head towards the North Pacific, then through Indonesia, crossing the Antarctic Circumpolar Current before reaching Cape Evans, which would take about 1,000 years. Because of that, Craig believed it almost certainly had become attached to something that could float, where the currents at the surface are much quicker albeit unpredictable. But even this was a stretch, as Craig admitted that in that scenario, it would still have to travel around the globe multiple times, and he hazarded a guess that it could be done in 13 years, which is how long it took for the card to be discovered. Finally, is the most likely theory that it was taken by someone to this location, where it was then discarded. But considering this place is so remote, and basically off limits to everyone but scientists, then how was it done? Of course, it's also been proposed that it was packed there by an animal. What type and how it did is still unknown. The forums of Fortiana.org is a site where users come together to discuss Fortian phenomena. Sometimes this is ghosts or cryptids or even UFOs. The site's name is taken from Charles Fort, one of the early 
and most influential paranormal researchers and writers, but it's in this thread entitled, Strange Folk, Not Obviously Human. The user, Crouton1198, would share a bizarre story in May of 2005. According to him, one day at work, he and a few other employees were sharing paranormal stories when one of the co-workers would state that he and a friend of his, along with his friend's young daughter, were walking down a country road one day, when all of a sudden, on the side of the road, standing about three feet off the ground, was a gnome-like being ringing a bell. And even stranger, this bell did not make a noise, or at least, not one they could hear. The gnome would even catch sight of the three, prompting him to vanish. The trio continued walking, not taking note of what had just happened, until a little further down the road, when the little girl questioned, who was that funny little man? And her father replied, yeah, who was that funny little man? And that's basically it on this one. The poster would state he lost touch with this former co-worker as he had not spoken to him in over 20 years, which puts this story taking place sometime before 1985. Although he couldn't remember a description of this gnome individual, the story of the hovering bell gnome stuck with him ever since. Another strange one here, with little to go on for a theory. The author of the post wondered if the trio were looking through a dimensional portal or something. Maybe that's why they could see the gnome, but not hear him. Of course, you can probably add some of the theories we discussed earlier too, like a glitch in the matrix, or maybe his co-worker had been tripping on drugs or something. Or even more likely, his co-worker was just pulling his leg. Or maybe, the author of the post made the whole story up. Sometimes on this iceberg, we get these incredibly obscure mysteries where there is so little information that it's almost impossible to cover. And that's what we get in this next one, when in 1969, the Sunday World News, a publication in Ireland, would tell of a story of a 16-year-old girl and her brother trespassing on the property of Gill Hall, a fairly famous estate built in Northern Ireland in the mid-1700s. By this point though, the property had long since been abandoned, but it was this day that these unnamed teenagers would spot something that looked like a balloon floating towards them. The balloon then strangely began to transform into the figure of a fat man with short hair that appeared to be wearing a white gown. The two frightened teens then fled the property, and that's basically it. No more info. Even though the story was reprinted three years later in a book called Psychic Phenomena in Ireland by Sheila St. Clair, there's not any more details or follow-up that I could find. However, in doing a little research on this old estate, which has since been torn down, I found that Gill Hall had a long history of being haunted. Actually, one of the most famous ghost stories in Ireland's history took place there. It starts with a John Lepower and Nicola Sophia Hamilton, both orphans and by some accounts, cousins, that were taken in and raised by a deist, who instilled in them a belief that although God created the world, nature was in charge. It was this teaching that directly contradicted the Christian education they received at school. So the two teenagers, seemingly confused by all this, made a pact that whomever died first would try to find a way to come back and tell the others if there was truly an afterlife or not. Unfortunately for John, he would be the first to receive that opportunity in October of 1693. Nicola, now known as Lady Beresford, just happened to be staying at Gill Hall that October when she awoke one night to see the ghost of John standing by her bed. He informed her that he was now dead and that there was indeed an afterlife. Of course, Nicola was startled and assumed she was dreaming, so she asked this ghost to give her a token that she would see upon awaking that would let her know this was real and not a dream. With that, John took his icy fingers and left a permanent mark on Nicola's skin, as well as leaving a handprint on a cabinet by the bed. He finally eerily told her she would die on her 47th birthday, and then he disappeared. The next morning, when Nicola awoke, sure enough, she discovered the mark on her wrist and a handprint on the cabinet. She was stunned to see it was not a dream. This obviously left her feeling unsettled the entire morning, and it only got worse because when the mail was delivered the next day, a letter arrived from John Stewart announcing John had passed away. This greatly unnerved Nicola, who assumed since everything else came true, 
that the prediction of her dying on her 47th birthday must also come true. So fast forward those 20 years to Nicola's 47th birthday and nothing happened, which must have brought her a lot of relief. However, it would be the following year on her birthday, she would throw a party with the family and excuse herself to go to another room, where she was found dead just a few minutes later. Now, was this a fictional account? An urban legend? Well, I was able to find that Nicola Sophia Hamilton did in fact exist, and her death date lines up with this story. I can only find one record of a John Lepower, but he died over a hundred years before this story even took place, so I'm unsure if there's just no record available for the John Lepower in this story, or if he never existed. Regardless, it's after all these events that Gill Hall gained its haunted reputation. In fact, according to the legend, allegedly, numerous people that stayed there over the centuries would report hearing strange noises and thumping on walls at all times of the night. Although, there are no actual records of this or the witnesses. But let's fast forward to the year of our mystery in 1969 when these two unnamed teenagers supposedly seen a balloon that changed into a fat man with short hair wearing a gown. Well, it wasn't long after this sighting that the old abandoned home partially burned and then would be demolished by the army. But exactly who was this man or this spirit? Was it possibly John or another entity or just another finely woven tale to add to the legend of Gil Hall? Between May 1918 and October 1919, a serial killer haunted the city of New Orleans. This man would become known as the Axe Man. He mainly targeted Italian immigrants and Italian Americans. To be more specific, usually ones that were connected to grocery stores. The murders followed a common theme. Usually, the killer would remove a panel from the back door of a home with a chisel, then attack the residents with what he could find on hand, typically an axe. But a couple of times, he used a straight razor. The attacks were particularly vicious. Seeing how he never took anything from the home, robbery was not the motive. And since the days of the murder, armchair sleuths have tried to come up with a theory as to what made him do this. One was that he was a sadist and the killings were sexually motivated, only killing male victims when they stood in the way of him attempting to assault a woman. The second more plausible theory was mafia-related killings. New Orleans was home to the first official mafia family in the U.S., and at the time, the mob was using grocery stores as fronts for rackets and extortions. This would explain why every case, except for one, involved someone who was connected to an Italian grocery store. Some crime buffs have actually connected the axe man to murders as early as 1910 and as late as 1922. However, these are disputed and the Axe Man is only officially connected to the murders of 1918 and 1919. He's most famous for allegedly writing and telling the people of New Orleans that if they played jazz music in their home on a particular night, he would spare them. However, the letter was never confirmed as being from the real Axe Man. While it's almost a given that the vast majority of people in New Orleans didn't play music in their home that night, there were significant amounts of people scared enough to do so as well as the numerous dance halls that spread out over the city. The crime spree would stop as quickly as it started, and although there's been conjecture over a person of interest named Joseph Mumphrey, no real suspects have ever been identified. October 25th, 1838, a 39-year-old man named David W. Patton who was an early leader in the Latter-day Saints movement and member of the Quorum of Twelve, would be involved in a skirmish called the Battle of Crooked River, a part of the 1838 Mormon War. And it's at this engagement that David Patton would be killed. And this would normally go down as nothing more than a footnote in history, if not for one odd thing that would come out in 1900, some 62 years later. When Patton's biography was published and it reprinted a letter from a man named Abraham O. Smoot, to Joseph F. Smith, sixth president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, Smoot was a Mormon missionary and future mayor of Salt Lake City and Provo. And it's in that letter that Smoot would report a bizarre claim 
told to him by David Patton. He would tell while on a mission to Tennessee, he was riding his mule when a strange being began walking beside him. For around two miles, this being was tall, with his head reaching even with Patton's shoulders, who was on a mule at that point. And this strange individual wore no clothing, but instead was covered with hair, and its skin was very dark. It told Patton he had no home and was cursed to life on Earth as a wanderer. He also relayed to him that he was a very miserable creature that sought death, but could not die, and his mission was to destroy the souls of men. Patton would rebuke him in the name of Jesus and commanded him to get out of his sight, to which the creature did. Now this account may sound similar to some of you that have read the Bible, because the story sounds a lot like it may have been Cain that he met. And on the off chance you're not familiar, Cain from the Bible, the son of Adam, killed his brother Abel and out of guilt sought death for it, but was denied by God and given the mission to destroy the souls of men. But let's look at the other part of Patton's account. He described this creature as being tall as his shoulders while he was on the back of a mule, which probably puts him at about seven to eight foot tall. But that wasn't all. This being was also not wearing clothes and was a hairy-like beast with dark skin. Doesn't that sound like Bigfoot? Yep, that brings us to the theory that Bigfoot, aka Sasquatch, is actually Abel's brother, Cain, punished to an eternal existence of walking the earth, destroying the souls of men. And while this sounds outlandish at first, it would explain the number of sightings popping up all over the world, and how he just appears and disappears at will. Or it might even be that Bigfoot slash Cain is omnipotent and has several versions of himself appearing all over the world at once. But what to actually make of the theory itself? It's important to note that Patton never refers to this being as Bigfoot. Actually, even though this letter wasn't published until 1900, it would be another 80 years before anyone connected it to Bigfoot. After a number of Sasquatch sightings occurred in South Weber, Utah, there's also the fact that in Genesis, Cain is never cursed with immortality. He's only cursed with a mark to prevent others from killing him. Finally, the biggest weakness in the theory is the fact that this account was written 65 years after the events even happened. And even then, it was only a second-hand account. There's no records left behind by Patton that details this encounter, but it is worth noting two other early church members also recorded seeing Cain, one a E. Wesley Smith and the other a Horace Rawson, who's seen a very strange man in Novu in 1847 that he said fit the description of Cain. The Sun Earth's personal star in the sky that keeps us warm and enables plant growth to fulfill our vegetation needs as well as pretty much doing everything else that keeps everything on Earth alive since, lucky for us, we live in the so-called Goldilocks zone where it's not too cold or not too hot. But what if none of that is true at all? What if the powers that be are hiding the real truth from us? The truth that the sun is actually made of ice. Yes. According to this theory, proposed by a user at the Coli.com forums named Messworld, whom upon reading the Spanish version of Google News outside of the USA, and therefore outside the grasp of the NSA censorship, he saw a curious story which detailed a scandal between Spain and the United States that came about because a group of Spanish solar research scientists were working on behalf of the Spanish government, and it led to them hacking into NASA's computers. Oh, and they done this only as a last resort. But upon getting into the systems, Messworld claimed Spanish scientists found proof covered up by NASA in which there was ice found on the sun. Messworld would then begin scouring for the English version of the story, but according to him, Google had hidden it at the behest of the US. And then the next day, it disappeared from the Spanish news as well. He then turns to the theory of code fusion, which is a hypothesized type of nuclear reaction that would occur at or near room temperature in contrast of hot fusion, which takes place within stars and hydrogen bombs. If NASA did discover ice on the sun, then it would point to the viability of cold fusion. And the idea that the sun is an icy system 
producing cold fusion energy would also give the U.S. motive to cover up such information in the name of potential military advantage of such technology. Mess World would go on to bring up the sub-zero temperature of outer space, comparing it to being like that of Siberia, with the only heat being what we feel on the Earth, and that NASA for decades has covered up the fact that there is no heat in space whatsoever, in spite of the fact that this giant ball of fire we allegedly see. But it gets crazier. He would continue to argue that the light itself is not hot, that it's really just a ball of light, as well as being hollow on the inside, like Earth, meaning an advanced civilization is living inside. These people operate a holographic display of visual effects, which we perceive as the sun. They did this as an attempt to deter humans who are warlike, and who would be afraid of the immense heat that this fake sun would project and they would stay away. Our heat instead comes about because of friction. As the Earth rotates, it creates friction due to the sun's magnetic pull. This friction causes the centrifugal force, and this is where the real heat is located. When the light of the sun is projected onto this field, this spreads the heat on the surface of the Earth, and this heat is only felt inside of the Earth's atmosphere and not outside in outer space. Pretty simple, right? Of course, there's no real proof for this, and it's just seen as pseudoscience. As far as to why space is cold, the sun doesn't contribute to any increase in temperature until it hits something and warms it up. And since space is empty, it doesn't heat up. Nineteen seventy, Bakersfield, California. A woman named Wanda Lockwood was playing with her little son in his bedroom when she would be disturbed by a very unsettling sound. She would describe hearing what sounded like a large steel hammer striking the concrete basement floor three times. It was so loud that it caused her young son Danny to start crying. As unsettling as it was for Wanda, it was not exactly new. In fact, several months earlier, she had heard a similar noise, only on that occasion it was beneath her living room floor. Wanda was now very curious as to what was making the noises under her home. So she got down and put her ear to the bedroom floor and listened closely. And she heard a bizarre noise. Down from below, she heard the roar of machinery. Probably not something she expected. Wanda wanted to know exactly what was going on. So she got an idea and grabbed a hammer and began to pound on the bedroom floor in a one, two, three, one, two, three, like manner for about five minutes, when all of a sudden, something, or someone, began to tap back in the same fashion. One, two, three, one, two, three. After these noises, she began to hear knocking around, and then began to faintly hear sounds of men talking to one another. The voices were too muffled to make out what they were saying, but she could hear them. Over the following months, she would hear the machinery off and on when she put her ear to the floor, but she never heard the voices again. So this is another one that we have precious little information available. What we do know comes from an issue of Fate magazine of April 1972, a US magazine that covers the paranormal. So theories are scarce, but I mean, the obvious one is that it was a total fictional account sent in to Fate magazine. I mean, I was unable to find a Wanda Lockwood from that area and that time period, but let's say it wasn't faked. Well, then the theories vary a little. Maybe the woman did hear sounds from the basement, like plumbing or something. Although, I imagine there should never be a sound like a large steel hammer hitting concrete on the basement floor, which also begs the question. When she put her ear down to the floor and heard the machinery and the men talking, why didn't she just walk down to the basement to see what it was? That part doesn't make sense. Other possibilities include that she could have just heard work being performed in the neighborhood somewhere else and the sound just reverberated up into the basement. In the heart of central western Queensland, near Long Reach, Australia, lies a very bizarre natural feature that left residents unnerved about a century ago. From the 1890s to the 1940s, several newspapers would carry a story about a mysterious pond called the Wilga Waterhole. It's here the domesticated animals brought to the area to drink began to act scared out of their minds 
panicking, refusing to partake of the water or even get near it. But that's only the minor part of this story, because the real eerie part of this watering hole is that of the noise that comes from the area. According to a 1941 newspaper article, a couple living nearby the water hole heard a horrible wailing sound that seemed to come from the pond itself. It lasted for a few seconds, first sounding far off, but within a few seconds, the pitch got louder and louder. It sounded like wailing and screaming made by several people, nothing animal or bird-like. Some have described it as sounding devilish or unearthly, but this incident is not the only one. In fact, going back as far as 1890, there was at least one account where three sheep shearers decided to camp near the watering hole, ignoring the warning from locals, only for the same scream to wake them around midnight, shaking them up so bad they fled without any of their supplies. There's also been other accounts over the years, and theories about its origins have varied as well. Of course, there's obviously the paranormal ones, like a story of a young man that died of thirst near the water hole, leaving his whimper to echo throughout the area to this day. There's also darker ones, like a young aboriginal servant boy sent to retrieve horses, only to be killed by wild boars and his screams for help going unanswered. Another story tells of a woman that killed her infant and her ghost screams in remorse haunting the location to this day. Of course, there's also the more mundane theories too, such as the powerful owl. No, that's not a description. It's an owl native to Australia, literally called the powerful owl, whose screech might be what people really heard. It's even possible that a subterranean river in the area causes the noise, which happens when water rushes through down below and in turn causes a shrieking-like sound. Beginning on August 24th, 2018, citizens living in the recently annexed Crimea would begin to notice something odd occurring to their vehicles. They were finding these oily rust-colored coatings settling onto their cars, and it wasn't just their vehicles. These same coatings were found on roofs and basically any kind of metallic surfaces. The oily substance was even found on jewelry and cookware, while leaves on trees began to quickly wither and fell off in spite of the fact that it was not autumn, while other citizens even reported seeing noxious clouds. It wasn't long before the citizens on the Ukrainian side of the border experienced the same issues, leaving the Ministry of Health to at least acknowledge the events by stating that they had received numerous reports of people experiencing respiratory difficulties and discomfort in their throats along with allergic reactions. It got so bad that breathing masks were distributed, although it didn't help. Making matters worse was when the humidity rose. This same chemical substance would burn your skin. Within the first few days of this, people began to suspect that it had been the Kremsky Titan plant, one of the largest producers of titanium dioxide on the European continent. It's typically used in paint, plastics, paper, and sunscreen. Of course, the Kremsky Titan plant denied everything, like Russia typically does, but strangely enough, it wasn't long after this denial, the representatives immediately shut down the plant for two weeks, as they said they had a high concentration of sulfur dioxide which had been detected. Russia would claim it was all the fault of Ukraine who stopped the water flow to the plant, but no one is sure to this day what actually caused it. Now we're at the part of the video I like to call Small Mystery Roundup. First, we start with the Tamagotchi suicides which is a creepypasta that revolved around the Tamagotchi, a virtual pet released by Bandai in 1996, quickly becoming a global phenomenon. It allowed users to simulate the life cycle of a pet from birth to death. Children and adults alike became deeply attached to these digital creatures, leading to a widespread popularity, so much so that some schools banned it because of its distraction it caused. The toy required regular care, and its high demand led to supply shortages. As the craze grew, the emotional attachment to it took a dark turn, or at least, according to this creepypasta, this stated several people would take their own lives after their virtual pets died. The jumping Frenchman illness is an extremely rare disorder characterized by an unusually extreme startled reaction. This reaction is a natural occurrence 
and is a rapid involuntary response to a sudden or unexpected stimulus. Although startle reaction is a normal human response, individuals with this disorder are exaggerated or abnormal. Symptoms usually begin after puberty. Individuals affected by this disorder display an abnormal and exaggerate startle reactions consistent of jumping, screaming, flailing of the arms, hitting, or throwing objects. It can be caused by things such as unexpected noises, sudden gestures, or unexpected physical contact such as a sudden poke in the ribs. After a statement, affected individuals may repeat backwards or phrases in a parrot-like manner, or they may involuntarily mimic or imitate movements or gestures. Some swear or utter obscene words or phrases. Some exhibit automatic or forced obedience after being startled, which they then automatically respond to simple commands such as jump, run, or hit. The symptoms decrease in frequency as the individual's age. The exact cause is unknown, although some speculate it could be a neurological disorder, while others think it is a cultural conditioning thing. Soma is a ritual drink referenced in the Rig Veda, one of the oldest sacred texts of Hinduism. It's the earliest reference to the use of fungi as a medicinal substance, which was the key ingredient. This intoxicating drink was believed to grant divine powers and was prepared from the toxic fly agaric mushroom, which contains psychoactive compounds. These compounds target the brain's receptors, leading to states of euphoria and hallucination though not without side effects such as sweating, nausea, and twitching. The Committee of 300 is a conspiracy theory that once again points the finger at this powerful group of individuals, 300 of them, that rule the world via politics, commerce, banking, media, and military. Only this time, the twist is, it was founded by the British aristocracy in 1727. The theory got started by a German politician in 1909, a Walter Rathenau, who being interviewed by a newspaper, claimed 300 men, all of whom know one another, guide the economic destinies of the continent and seek their successors from their own milieu. Now, according to him, this was an attack on the oligarchy. However, some people took this chance to imply that he was actually talking about Jewish people, and it kind of spiraled out of control after that. The theory was written about 1997 in a book called The Conspirator's Hierarchy, The Committee of 300, written by John Coleman. But it's not really so much about these alleged 300 powerful individuals and more just like an excuse to hate on certain groups while simultaneously listing his source as, just trust me bro. The Monster Eats 15 Miners in Dixonville, Pennsylvania is an internet legend about an alleged mine disaster that happened in Dixonville, Pennsylvania in 1944, where these underground creatures, or cannibalistic humanoids, allegedly attacked and killed miners. The story was odd in the fact that it seemed pretty authentic, but it's really just a complete fabrication and an early version of creepypasta, as it most likely can be traced back to paranormal and UFO websites in the late 1990s. Now, let's get back to the program. On September 8, 1863, 8-year-old George Albright was playing on a beach at Sandy Cove, Nova Scotia when he discovered an odd sight. In the sand lie a swarthy young man with both legs amputated just above the knees. George would go to get help, and two farmers would come back to help take the castaway back to town. Residents would begin to question this man, but he didn't reply, so they speculated he did not speak English. They would eventually ask him his name and he would mumble something that resembled Jerome, and this is what he would become known as. After looking over Jerome more, they realized that his amputation had been done by a skilled surgeon. Even more bizarre was they were only partially healed, as they were found to still be bandaged. He also suffered from hypothermia from being left out on the beach overnight. People from all over the area would travel to see him in his sickbed. Different languages were tried in efforts to communicate with the man as well. French, Latin, Italian, and Spanish. Yet, he did not understand or just refused to communicate. Although, he would sometimes growl like a dog at unwanted guests. He was described as Mediterranean in appearance, 
while his hands were noted as being too soft for manual labor. George's parents did not have the money to support another person in their home, so Jerome would bounce from house to house for a while until this Baptist community somehow came up with the thought that Jerome must have came from a Catholic background. It's because of this they would send him to the neighboring French community of Michigan. It was at this point the Nova Scotia government would provide a $2 a week stipend to support Jerome. The community would eventually send him to stay with a man named Jean Nicola, who also spoke several languages. He would keep Jerome in his home for the next seven years, and Jerome spoke very little, although he was able to speak a few fragmented sentences. He revealed he had came over on a vessel named the Colombo. He would next move in with Zedir and Zabeth Camo in St. Alfonso de Clare near Medigan. He was here that the Camos took advantage of his fame, charging admission fees to see the mystery man. A couple of theories about this man and how he ended up on the beach with recent amputations had been proposed ever since. One suggestion was that he was in line for a big inheritance and someone did away with him so they could be the sole inheritor instead. Yet, it doesn't make sense as to why they wouldn't just kill him. Some thought he could have been a wounded officer from a European war, or perhaps even the Civil War in the United States. One of the bigger questions is why Jerome was unable to walk, and it's thought he suffered a stroke from the hypothermia damaging a part of his brain. Finally, a theory in 2008 stated that on the other side of the Bay of Fundy in Chipman, New Brunswick, in the year 1859, just four years before Jerome was discovered on the beach, a man fell through river ice. He developed gangrene in both legs due to the accident and had to have them amputated. Upon waking, the man kept saying, Gambi, which he was probably trying to say, Gamba, which meant leg in Italian. Here he became known as Gambi. It's thought that Gambi became too much of a burden for the people of Chipman, and it was rumored that someone in town paid a passing ship to transport him away. The captain could have possibly just sailed to the opposite side of the bay to Nova Scotia and dropped him off on Sandy Cove. In fact, several witnesses stated it was the same person. However, to this day, no one is for sure. Kenneth Burnett, a man living in Katuma, New South Wales, Australia, was in for a heck of a bizarre experience after what should have been a very nondescript drive. Now when this occurred, I cannot say, as the book that it's featured in, Great Australian Mysteries 2 by John Pinky, never gives a timeline, but since the book was published in 2006, it had to happen before then. According to Kenneth, who would later take the story public, he and his wife were traveling down the highway from Tamworth to Armadale when they suddenly came across a detour sign which directed them off onto a side road. This road was very narrow and had poplar trees running along it, which made it even stranger that the sun was out and yet these trees, nor car, cast a shadow. They would continue driving not really focusing too much on that oddity, but they would soon encounter other strangeness. When they came to a tunnel, or what they thought was a tunnel, they would notice the roof was very low. They entered anyways and drove a long time until they finally exited the tunnel to a road that took them back to the highway. But it gets weirder. As dusk approached, Kenneth would turn his headlights on, but they failed to show the light at every curve in the road. They would finally reach their destination at 10 p.m., only to realize it took them a full day and a few night hours to drive about 70 miles. And because they had arrived so late, they decided not to wake their relatives where they had planned on staying. Instead, they slept in the car. Kenneth would report he tried to have a cigarette, but neither the lighter nor matches worked. That's when he realized there was no oxygen in the vehicle and they were freezing cold. He would quickly open the window, which gave them oxygen, and they warmed up again. The following morning, Ken would contact the highway department to learn that there had been no detours or road work the previous day. He thought that was strange, so he checked a map of the area and soon found there were no tunnels in the area either. Another bizarre one here, and again, not much to go by. As far as theories, this one is a little more difficult since there were two people in the car, so it's not likely they both fell asleep and dreamed the same thing. So that leaves us with the same theories that we discussed prior. Either a reality glitch, or they traveled to an alternate dimension, or maybe the two made up the account. And although highly doubtful, 
as if their car was somehow able to cut off all oxygen, they could have been hallucinating as they were losing air. What's in a name? That's obviously a popular quote from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, but it's probably a question that Quintus Valerius Serranus should have asked himself way back in 82 BC, because Valerius holds a rather unique distinction in Roman history for being a man that was executed for speaking the secret name of Rome. Before we dive down into this one, let's take a closer look at Valerius. He was born sometime between 140 and 130 BC and became a Latin poet and more importantly, a tribune of the people in the late Roman Republic. But most famously, you have him to thank for one of the most underappreciated inventions in literature. He created the first table of contents. So next time you pick up a book and open it to see that, give Valerius a thumbs up. But back to our strange mystery. What is the deal with Rome's secret name? The best account we have comes from a man named Servius the Grammarian, who had a reputation as being one of the most learned men in Italy between the 4th century and early 5th century AD, and most famously known now for his commentaries on the works of Virgil. He would record that Valerius, according to many sources he came across, dared to disclose this secret name. Some would say he was then hauled in by the Senate and hung up on a cross, while others would state that Valerius fled in fear of retribution, but was apprehended by a praetor in Sicily and was killed by the order of the Senate. But there's problems with this story. First of all, crucifixion was usually a reserved punishment for slaves at this time in the late Republic, as the belief was even those Romans who deserved it still should not be victim of that cruel punishment. Secondly was the issue of Valerius, who was a tribune's person, which by law made him a very important person. And what's even more uncertain was whether these tribunes that Valerius was a member of would even know Rome's secret name to begin with. And if you think this is all the mistake of one author, that of Servius, well both Pliny the Elder and Plutarch note that Valerius was indeed executed for uttering that secret name. There's also the issue that we don't even know how Valerius allegedly publicized this secret name. Some have suggested he made the name public in a work of his called Epoptitis, which if interpreted as it is sometimes, it might mean tutelary deities, which means something like a deity or spirit that is a guardian of a particular place or region, nation, etc which could hint that Rome's secret name was some kind of deity. However, others dispute this claim, even Servius, who stated that the name was never recorded, which I guess means that Valerius only spoke of it and did not write it down. The modern historians now doubt that Valerius was really killed for this reason anyways, arguing that his execution was politically motivated. And of course, Rome had various factions that were always going back and forth at each other, and there's no need for me to dive down into those reasons of why he was killed, and instead get back to the mystery, which is the actual name itself. And there's just not a lot of theories on that. We can go back to the deity theory, if that's what it was, and it's possible that Valerius did write it down as an act of treason, because the Romans thought that if you expose the name of this deity, he would leave the city unprotected. Other theories suggest names like Maya, a Greek goddess, Herpa, the goddess that watched over the city, Evia, which Plato translates as life, and Valencia. According to modern scholars, Maya could be the secret name because she is the largest of the seven Pleiades, which could symbolize the seven hills of Rome. The Egyptian pyramids is one of the most mysterious construction projects in history people for thousands of years have wondered just how in the world did they do it. But it's not just the pyramids. There's a bunch of other megalithic structures from around the world that seen these massive stones, sometimes weighing several tons, that are lugged for long distances in efforts to build with, like the Temple of Jupiter, which contains the three largest stone blocks ever used in a man-made structure, weighing close to 1,000 tons, yet are positioned together with precision or Perta del Sol, which stands 13,000 feet above sea level in Bolivia and weighs 10 tons, and how it got to this location so high up is still unknown. Or Nan Madel in Micronesia, 
which is made up of hundreds of stacked stone logs that weighed two and a half tons each. But just how was it done with no modern equipment? Well, let's go back to the pyramids. Although no one knows for sure how it was done, a lot of scholars now lean more towards the thought that the Great Pyramid was built by using ropes, pulleys, ramps, ingenuity, and brute force. And that force was made up of 4,000 to 5,000 men working for around 20 years to do so, which is certainly plausible. But if we go a little further into the future, around the 10th century, an Arab historian named Abu Hassan Ali Ali Masuadi would go to the pyramids and was in awe of them. And it's here he would record something rather interesting. He wrote that the stones were transported by a magic papyrus or paper, which was placed under the stone to be moved. Then the stone was struck with a metal rod that caused the stone to levitate and move along a path paved with stones and fenced on either side by metal poles. That allowed it to move about 160 feet where it would then settle back down to the earth. This process was repeated over and over until the stones got to its desired location. But just where did Al Musadi come up with this? Was it some part of oral legend that had been passed down? Or was it just his theory to explain it? That is hard to say. But it opens up a rather interesting fringe theory that these ancient structures were built by ancient acoustic levitation, which states that the ancient peoples figured out a way to strike the rock and create vibrations that resulted in sonic levitation. Or possibly, that the layout of stone and rods created some sort of magnetic field which then levitated it. There's not much on this theory, although Edward Leeds Scotland in the 20th century spent 20 years building Coral Castle in Florida, which saw him raise at least one stone that weighed 35 tons. But he did all that without machinery, and he did it all privately and told people he discovered the secret of how the ancients built it, but he never divulged it. There's also a lesser known account from a Dr. Jarl, who in 1939 said he's seen Tibetan monks levitating a large stone using drums, trumpets, and chanting. He allegedly even filmed the whole event, but the videos were confiscated. And that would actually be one of the few interesting lost media mysteries. Regardless, the Egyptians probably didn't move them that way. Scientists do believe such a thing is possible though, as there have been experiments where sound waves have been used to move liquid droplets, but so far, nothing major has been moved. When we lay down to sleep every night, we often think this is the one place in the entire world that we are safe. Our little space where nothing should ever invade, but what happens when that space is violated? Doctors Patricia Ken and Vena Bonnet set out to find that in 2017 when they began interviewing people who claimed they had been abducted by aliens. They would first meet with a woman who went by the name Miss S and ask her to elaborate on her experiences. The now adult Miss S would recall lying awake in her bed during her teen years looking up at the ceiling unable to sleep when she seen a spider start to descend down. As it slowly dropped, the spider opened its legs and Miss S heard something she would never have expected. The sound reminded her of a dentist drill. The spider continued to lower, getting larger as it got closer to her face. Miss S was unable to scream for help or move, except her eyes, obviously. So the spider clamped its legs around her head and she claimed began to bore a hole into her skull. She could not actually feel the drill go in, but it was painful nonetheless. This would be one of the few experiences Miss S would have over the years, as she also experienced undergoing examination and probing, communicating with aliens, and even giving birth. And although this sounds crazy, did you know that around 1% of the US population have reported alien abduction experiences? Which might range anywhere from what Miss S reported to UFO sightings or even straight up being abducted by a UFO. And actually, the number is almost certainly higher because in this research, it was found that around 80% of the anonymous abductees reported that they had not told anyone about it because of the negative consequences, such as their friends and family thinking they're crazy. Most even stated they would not tell their doctor. So chances are the number of abductees are higher. But what's even more interesting is what they found in other research with abductees. In a 17-year study, 
It was found that alien abductees share common traits. They're usually self-sufficient, resourceful, above average in intelligence, more reserved, and more introspective. Having said that, what exactly is the cause of these experiences? That is the debate here. As far as Miss S goes, she could have been having seizures, or a sleep disorder, or maybe even psychosis, possibly false memories or hallucinations stemming from childhood trauma. Well, that's what one would typically think. But all of those theories were ruled out after various tests were done, which leaves us with the obvious theory that this was all due to sleep paralysis. As one of the 30% of people that have suffered sleep paralysis, I have to say, I have never experienced anything like Miss S. However, only about 5% of sleep paralysis sufferers actually have hallucinations. And in sleep paralysis episodes, subjects report having intense fear, breathing difficulties, and body pressure, particularly on the chest. And as we have discussed in a previous video, this might also account for the hat man sightings, who just coincidentally like to stand on the chest of people while they're asleep. Even less surprising is many patients have reported seeing demonic figures witches, Freddy Krueger, and aliens. Even more specifically, some have reported being visited by aliens or being abducted while they are in sleep paralysis, which pretty much solves this mystery. However, no theory section would be complete without some craziness, and it's just possible that Miss S was truly visited or abducted by aliens, or perhaps this spider was some sort of cryptid encounter. May 1913, Farmersville, Texas. A 12-year-old boy named Silby Latham was working on the family farm with his brothers Sid and Clyde. As the three of them were chopping cotton, they began to hear their dogs suddenly start barking, and not any old bark, and instead, it sounded like the dogs had treed something, perhaps a possum or a raccoon. So the boys went back to work, not thinking much of it, but the dogs kept at it and got even more intense. Clyde, the eldest brother, would finally stop working and told his younger brothers, let's go see what they treed. So all three of them would head that way, where the dogs were about 50 to 75 feet on the other side of a picket fence. Clyde made it there first, and Silby would later state that his older brother had a stunned look on his face. He then turned around to his younger brothers and said, it's a little man. Silby, who gave this account to Fate Magazine, in November 1978, would further describe the man as being about a foot and a half tall, dark green in color, looking towards the north, and looking like he was possibly resting. Silby could not recall if he wore shoes, but did not remember seeing any feet either. But his arms hung down beside him, as if they had grew that way. He also wore a hat that was round and looked like a Mexican one, except it looked like it was built into him. Curiously, there were no clothes. Instead, it looked like it was a rubber suit, even the hat. The little man stood there, scared to death, and for good reason, because just as the boys closed in to get a better look, the dogs jumped onto him and began to rip him to shreds. Blood spilled everywhere, and the being's insides, which looked human, fell to the ground. The brothers continued to watch as the dogs ripped his legs off, and during all this, this alien being did not make a sound or, as Silby later recalled, if he did, they couldn't hear it because of the noise of the dogs attacking. The brothers didn't know what to make of what had just happened, and Silby would tell Fate Magazine that they were just dumb country boys and didn't know what to do, so they just went back to their farming. Although, I guess it's possible that the shock was just too much for them. Regardless, they would walk back and talk about what they had just witnessed, and two or three times that day, they went back to check on the remains which were now rotting in the sun. Curiously, the dogs huddled around them as if they were scared. Later that evening, the boys told their parents about the strange event, who understandably did not believe a word of it. So the next day, the boys went back to look at the spot where the incident had occurred, and they were surprised to see that not one shred of evidence was left. It had completely vanished. They would even go search around the area, but found nothing. The story remained just a family tale for over 60 years when Silby's grandson would reach out to the Center for UFO Studies in 1978 
which led to Sylvie being interviewed in Fate magazine. But it was his grandson that would go on to state that his grandfather had a good reputation and had sat on the secret for all those decades because of the ridicule he knew he would face. But now, he was ready to talk. But it was the Center for UFO Studies that reached out to the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History to look into the case. A Larry Sessions would interview Selby and stated, while he believed that the old man was sincere in his account, he believed that his older brothers played a trick on him. And over the years, Selby's imagination embellished it some. He even suggested to Selby that maybe what he really seen was a big frog, which of course, Selby disagreed with. So what to make of this one? Did Selby really meet a tiny alien that was then mauled to death by his dogs? Or did his older brothers play a trick on him? Or is it possible Selby was trying to pull a hoax on the magazine? I had actually heard this account before, and I've always found it disturbing. Maybe because of the details of the dogs ripping this alleged alien apart. However, one thing I had never heard until I started research for this segment was a little known fact that completely changes the outlook on this bizarre saga. Two years after the alien was found in the field, allegedly, Silby and one of his brothers were sitting on their uncle's porch when they seen a mysterious object with two lights, one on the front and one in the back, and this object sailed by them silently. They claimed it was cylinder shaped, like an airplane without wings. Then, three years after that, they allegedly seen a ball of fire about the size of a wash tub fall from the sky 50 feet behind their house. They rushed outside to see a light gray powder on the ground in a circle about three foot in diameter, but there was no indentation in the ground and no object. So when you factor in these other two stories told by Silby, it really takes away from the believability of the first one. If he had told the one about the alien being mauled by the dogs and left it at that, I would kinda wonder. But now that I know he also had a couple of other bizarre accounts, it just makes it seem like it's all a hoax. Of course, that's just me. And maybe he did have some weird connection to the paranormal and they really did watch an alien get murdered by their dogs. Many of you that have been gracious enough to follow the channel for a long time will know I have never spoke on my faith or beliefs in specific religions. However, this next mystery involves a religion that I would be fully supportive of, and it's called Adonatology, the worship of women with big butts. You heard that right, big butts. On the website of this minor religion, it discusses in its holy book, known as Book of Beginnings and Calabagos, that the Holy Spirit, whose name is Isa Elohim, is the wife of King Adonis I, hence the name of the religion, Adonatology. Now, Isa is actually a Calipigian deity, and of course, Calipigian is an adjective meaning you have a beautifully shaped butt, specifically describing statues such as Aphrodite. But Isa and King Adonis had many sons and daughters who were later cited by other religions as being the Nephilim angels who came to earth and mated with the daughters of man, which then brought forth giants, while the daughters that came down as Calipigian angels, or may be better described as big butt angels, mated with the men on earth. Now this one seems entirely like a meme. In fact, it's even listed on this iceberg under the meme slash internet legends category. But the guy did put in a lot of work to pull this off. His religious website describes himself as a multifaceted musician, composer, film producer, best-selling author, influential media mogul, and spiritual leader. The membership to his site is $35 a month, and it's not even certain what you get for this, other than a video and audio series and weekly updates. Although he does claim the church's main goal is to empower women with curves and big butts to discover self-love and acceptance which I guess is achieved through their worship sessions, which includes twerking. Although it's mostly a joke, a spiritual connection to big booties is something I can get behind. Sir Robert Victor Goddard is a name you may not be familiar with, but is a fairly famous name in England, where he was a military man. He was a senior commander of the Royal Air Force during World War II, and participated in many famous battles, and even flew reconnaissance flights over the battlefield during the Battle of Somme. 
in the First World War, and he served in total 41 years in the British military, where he was also given some very prestigious awards. Having said that, that's not why he is famous today. Instead, he would be because he took an interest in paranormal phenomena, as well as having his own clairvoyant incident in 1946, one that would even become the plot for a movie about a decade later. But as you know, this is the obscure iceberg, and since I had a movie made about it, that's not very obscure. So instead, we're going to discuss the lesser known clairvoyant experience Goddard had. Actually, you may call it a time slip. In 1935, Goddard was appointed to the Deputy Director of Intelligence at the Air Ministry, a job he held until the start of World War II. It's around this time that the RAF assigned him on a mission to fly out to the RAF Dream in Scotland and inspect the airfield which had been decommissioned for some time. So he jumped into his plane and took off. When he got there, he discovered the field was in pretty rough shape, with cattle wandering around, grazing on the grass that had came up through the cracks on the tarmac. But it's what happened later when our mystery comes in. Because on his way back, he would fly into a storm, one with odd brown yellow colored clouds, and he was worried about the biplane's ability to make it through. So he turned around and flew back to Dream intending to land and wait the storm out. But when he made it back to the abandoned airfield he had just left, he returned to see it was very much active now. On the ground below, he seen several planes along with the mechanics crew moving about the area. The airfield had been completely renovated as well. Strangely, he noticed a lot of the planes had been painted yellow, and one of these was a monoplane he could not identify. Unfortunately, the storm he had ran into must have followed him, because Goddard was unable to land and had to navigate the storm, and by the time he came out on the other side, he was on his way back to the home base, where he landed safely and immediately told his friends what had happened. And of course, they didn't believe him, and after their negative reaction to the story, he didn't tell anyone about it for years for fear of being ridiculed. Now obviously, it was already strange enough that the airfield had been very active just a few minutes after Goddard seen it abandoned. But it would get stranger yet, because this airfield would officially get reactivated in 1939. And it's right around that time that the RAF began painting their training planes yellow, and also when they changed the mechanics uniforms from tan to blue. Exactly what Goddard had seen years prior. Of course, there's two main theories on this one. The first one is Goddard experienced a genuine time slip, which took him a few years ahead to see the future of what the airfield would look like. While the other theory is, Goddard hallucinated, or straight up fabricated the whole account. Keep in mind, he was big into the paranormal, and would claim a similar account happened about a decade after this one, and that account was so big that it led to a movie. July 28, 1974, Somerset, England. A man named Peter Williamson had arranged for some of his friends to get together for some drinks and barbecue. Peter had become quite rich and owned a large home where he lived with his wife and two children, and his buddies were all warming up with their drinks when a storm suddenly blew in. Luckily, the patio area had been covered, so the party was fine. In fact, it was kind of nice as that evening had been pretty hot, so it kinda cooled things down. But during the storm, one of Peter's children noticed that their dog had ran and hid under a bush and was there cowering. Peter did not want his kids running out into the storm, so he told his child to stay put and rushed across the lawn to snatch up the dog. But it was about halfway across the yard that a flash of lightning hit and struck a tree in the neighbor's garden. We split it down the middle, and although that would shake up everyone at the party, it was soon that they learned it was more disturbing than what they thought, because when the flash of lightning hit, it silhouetted Peter, who then vanished, right in front of his wife Mary, kids, and friends. Mary screamed, and the children immediately started crying. I can only assume that they thought he was struck by the lightning. His friends rushed out into the yard to look for him, as well as in the garden of their neighbors, but there was not one clue of what happened to Peter. They would actually end up calling the police, who also did a cursory search in the yard and garden. By this point, Mary was losing it and was really freaked out, so much so that she was sedated 
While their children went to stay with family friends, two of the friends that had came to the barbecue stayed that first night, taking turns watching for Peter throughout the night, just in case he returned. However, he never came back, and everyone was pretty much stumped. But detectives did come up with a somewhat plausible theory. They believed what had happened was that the lightning strike was so close and bright that it temporarily blinded all the witnesses, Mary, her children, and Peter's friends. And in all the craziness that transpired, what they believed was only a second or two actually was around a minute. Heck, maybe even closer to two minutes before they were able to fully see again. Meanwhile, in that time frame, that same lightning strike and loud thunder that accompanied it triggered some sort of past trauma in Peter, either causing amnesia or disorientation, causing him to walk away confused. This was pitched to Peter's loved ones, and his friends agreed that it was very possible, but there were some issues with it. First of all, the garden Peter was in was surrounded by a very high wall, one that only had one way out, a door by the garage, which had been locked by Mary because the latch was broken, and it only had one key, which was in Mary's pocket. And on the wall, there were no markings from where Peter would have had to scale it to get across, which would have been difficult anyways. Regardless, the authorities were now thinking they were looking for a lost and confused man, and they put out an alert that would eventually go nationwide, with TV shows and the news even covering the events. Yet, this didn't bring in one tip. But here's where things get strange. Three days into the search, a local gardener would be stumped when he discovered a man lying in some shrubbery with one foot sitting in an ornamental pool. Of course, this man was Peter. He was around 8 a.m. that morning, and this area was pretty secluded, which made it stranger. Peter's clothes were also dry with no sign of morning dew on them, suggesting he had not laid out in the garden overnight. Even stranger was Peter did not have a key on him, yet he managed to get into this garden via the road, and that's what police speculated, although there were no marks of an injury. Peter was taken to the hospital where it was confirmed he had lost a memory, and detectives assumed since they were right on that part, they were right about everything else and closed the case. Peter, meanwhile, began to get well about a week later, but could not remember where he had disappeared to for those three days. Even worse was he began having strange dreams about a time he seemed to have spent in another place, much like his home area. In these dreams, he was soaking wet in the middle of a garden with no memory of anything that had happened before. When he came to, he was standing among flower beds on a small road feeling frightened, so he began to walk down the road. He walked for a long time until he felt tired and sat down on the side of the road. That's when a passing doctor stopped to offer some help and drove Peter to the hospital. But since he was not carrying any form of ID and could not tell them anything, they sent for the police who said they would check their missing persons files. The doctor's name that began working with Peter was named Nugent. While he also met with a Sister Alice Charles, he also remembered the names of various nurses as well as the name of the ward, Pritchard. These dreams were very vivid, so much so, he couldn't really tell if it was a dream or a memory. He would even tell the doctor in that dream that he was having hallucinations, like seeing the rooms of the ward shimmer and faces and furniture appearing entirely different from what he normally seen there. And these sightings were momentary. This caused the doctor to check him for a concussion, but they found none. The next day, he was allowed to go for a walk when Sister Alice said his jeans were too muddy to be wearable. That's when a man in the next bed over lent him a pair of corduroy slacks. Peter then went for tea at the hospital cafe, read a book, and got some sleep. The police showed back up a little while later and asked him if he remembered anything yet, and he didn't. The following morning, he felt better, but he still didn't remember anything, so he decided to go for a walk in the garden before breakfast but it was too muddy due to rain, so he decided to walk out along a country road, and he came across a scene that he was familiar with, and he realized he was close to the point where he had lost his memory. So he had to go closer and get a better look on the off chance he might further jog his memory. And remember, this is all a dream, and it's at this point of the dream that he walks over to some turf towards the garden where he was found later on. These dreams occurred over a three-week period, and they were in different segments which allowed him to piece it all together. 
although some nights he had no dreams at all. Now it gets even more interesting, because Peter quickly forgets this whole weird saga and goes on with his life and work. But one day, his son asked him for a ride to a nearby motorcycle rally. Now Peter had been to this place before, and he knew it was muddy, so he wanted to find some old clothes to take, but he searched for his old jeans and did not see them, and bam, it hit him. According to the dreams, he should have no jeans, but instead, a pair of corduroy trousers that did not belong to him. Insane as it was, Peter found those slacks. They had been cleaned and pressed and set into his wardrobe. His wife apparently had them cleaned for him. After going to the hospital to pick him up and all the excitement of finding him, she never once questioned where the slacks had came from. But now Peter thought, if I can track down who gave me these, I can figure out where I was. He found a tailor's label inside with the name Herbert Fox, who was located in a well-known West Country town. There was also a clothing label with monogrammed initials, JB, that had been sewn into it, which was a fairly common practice to initial the tags in your clothing back then. Peter was getting excited at getting close to unlocking the mystery of what had happened to him for those three days. He quickly searched the directory for the tailor, but came up empty. He then drove over 100 miles to this small town and began asking people about that tailor shop, and none of them had heard of it before. He even went to the local chamber of trade, where they did confirm a shop had existed there at one time, but it burnt down in the 1950s and never reopened. Peter returned home defeated with his new trousers, which, by the way, were not even a style that they had made in the 50s. He was so obsessed with figuring this out that he began searching for other towns with that name in the U.S., but came up empty there too. And again, the mystery went cold for a while, until one day when Peter ran into an old friend that lived a couple of miles away. He had just recently gotten out of the hospital after getting a minor operation. Peter was asking him about it and conversing with him when the man suddenly said the name Nugent. Peter was now ecstatic and immediately asked him where this hospital was, and he was surprised to find out that it was actually not even a half a mile away. Peter had not known of this one because it was a cottage hospital, which are much smaller, and in the past, Peter had only known about the larger general hospital in town, but now he rushed to visit the smaller hospital on the outskirts of town. The area seemed familiar to him, just like he had seen in a dream, or was it his memories? He rushed into the hospital and asked the receptionist to speak to Dr. Nugent, and she asked Peter to wait. A few minutes later, Dr. Nugent, the man with this friendly face that had helped Peter during that time, finally walked into the room and asked, you wanted to see me? Peter, a bit taken back by the fact that the doctor didn't recognize him, began telling his story, and Dr. Nugent said, I'm afraid you have the wrong hospital. I've never seen you before, and I haven't had an amnesia case for five years. The doctor, probably wanting to help more, took Peter to a tiny tea room and explained that amnesia had weird side effects where you can dream up complete scenarios in your head, all from a simple remark heard while in your susceptible state, and he theorized that someone at the general hospital had mentioned Dr. Nugent's name during that state Peter was in. Because Dr. Nugent had did some work for the general hospital, and Sister Charles had actually accompanied him when she went, which explained why he knew her too. He further suggested that the trousers were probably just loaned to him by someone at the general hospital. This story appeared in a book called Encounters with the Unknown, and the author actually visited Peter and interviewed him, and Peter actually showed him the trousers, and since the tailoring marks are public record, it was confirmed that that tailor who marked the label on the slacks was a legit marking from a very real tailor. Most curiously though, the zipper and the slacks were a new kind that came out in 1968, 14 years after the tailor shop had burned down, meaning someone would have had to taken the label out of an old pair of trousers and sewn them into a new pair. But the author pursued that theory and contacted the company that made the slacks, who confirmed that the label in them were the original and had not been tampered with. So how did a tailor from the 1950s, whose shop had burned down, put a mark into a label 14 years later? Strangely, the manufacturer of those slacks even asked how to get into contact with the tailor because apparently 
The color was not the exact color of their slacks, but they liked the color so much they wanted to know what dye he had used, but they could never find the man to ask him. All in all, a crazy one. Maybe the craziest one I've ever covered, which basically has a couple of theories. First, back to the parallel universes again, where several clues point to. In particular, when Peter claimed to have seen the hospital ward shimmering, that could have been an indication that the two universes were in flux around him at that time. Similarly, others have pointed to a glitch in the reality theory, which makes just as much sense. Really, the most intriguing claim of this whole story is those pants. Everything else can be explained as amnesia, but those pants throw a real twist in that theory. The only other option might be that this is a total fictional account. I was unable to find a Peter Williamson, and it does seem rather odd that a missing persons case that allegedly got press coverage all over England has no record of that search online today. It seemingly all comes from this one account in this book, which makes the whole thing seem sketchy. This brings us to the conclusion of part eight of the Obscure Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. We are now about halfway through layer three. I hope you all enjoyed. Goodbye and good night.